Welcome back Arisen. This video will cover all the main gameplay systems involved in Dragon's Dogma 2. If you haven't been keeping up with it and you just see that the game's about to come out and you're like, oh my god, I've got like months of videos to watch to understand this game. I've compiled everything I know about the game before release into a single video. If you have been keeping up with everything, maybe there'll be things in here that you were not aware of. And if you're watching this after Dragon's Dogma 2 has been released, I do think this will be a good introductory video into how the game plays and how it functions to the best of my ability, of course, without actually having played the game. But how then am I making a video about Dragon's Dogma 2 if I haven't played? There is a lot of content already out there about Dragon's Dogma 2, mainly because there have been hands-on sessions. I went through tons of videos. IGN, Eurogamer, Maximilian, GamesRadar, uh, Rurik Han, uh, Ouroboro, Remap, Arix, Dantix. I got all those videos. I watched a whole bunch of hands-on previews. I read a bunch of articles and interviews with the directors. I went through and categorized everything that they spoke about or everything they showed, put them all into a video, dumped it all into Premiere Pro, categorized it in here, and then of course produced a script, which is what you're about to hear on everything we know about Dragon's Dogma 2. So it's all in one stop shop, one place. Now there are 10 main categories that I'm going to cover, like NPCs, quests, destiny and exploration, which is like the map, vocations, which are your skills, um, combat, campfires at night time, wake stones, pawns, and then there are about 40 subcategories. So like under pawns, we're going to talk about main pawns, body type impacts, hiring pawns, pawn specializations, pawn knowledge, dragon's plague, and pawn inclinations. That's a lot of pawn. What I'm saying is there will be chapters down below for each main category. Skip about as much as you like. If you want to watch me play Dragon's Dogma 2 live, I'll be playing it over on Twitch, be an absolute degenerate. And if you want to see more Dragon's Dogma content, be sure to like and hit the subscribe button. All right, script time. I forgot to say that I've done my best to match footage. However, during the gameplay capture events, while they played for three hours, they were only allowed to show 20 minutes of gameplay on their channels. So often content creators would confirm a mechanic verbally, but they couldn't show the footage. Let's start with a brief overview. Dragon's Dogma 2 is a single player open world action RPG. While there is no co-op mode, there is an online component that allows you to interact with other real players. The pawn system. Pawns look like humans or beast wren, but are actually not. They have no will of their own and are loyal to the Arisen. You play as the Arisen, someone who has challenged the dragon and lost their heart. Pawns are AI controlled and you can have up to three pawns assist you, helping you in combat and during quests. You have a main pawn which you can customize their appearance and then you can hire another two pawns. This is where the online component comes into play because you can hire the pawns of other real players. You don't need to have played the first Dragon's Dogma to jump into the sequel and the concept of Arisen, those who challenged the dragon, who devoured their hearts, and pawns, those are loyal to the Arisen, is all you really need to know to get going. Let's talk about quests. Side quests, time quests, race, and save files. As you progress through the game, people or beastrin will often approach you with some sort of problem, triggering a side quest. This was the most common occurrence in the hands-on playthroughs, but I assume not all side quest wielding NPCs will run at you. Quests in Dragon's Dogma 2 have less direction in terms of waypoint markers than most people would be accustomed to. A common example is the shopkeeper who yells at you about his missing son who was dragged off by wolves. To continue the quest, you need to ask people around town to gather more information. You don't know who to specifically ask, but just in general, you need more info. The YouTube channel, Remap, did say that once they did get enough information from the townspeople, a general area to look into was marked on the map, but they had to use the information gathered to find the specific location of the boy. I think it reasonable to say that you are going to have to listen to the dialogue for clues on how to complete your quest, rather than doing what I normally do, which is skip all the dialogue and hope that there is a waypoint marker exactly where I need to go. Pawns can also assist you in providing vital knowledge for how to complete quests, which I'll speak about a bit later. Some quests will also be time sensitive, meaning if you do not act on them quickly, you will fail them. Another common example was with the shopkeeper who lost his son. 
If you acted quickly, you would discover the child in the cave surrounded by the wolves. However, some people rested at a campsite rather than continuing through the night, and when they arrived at the cave, the boy was gone, as in gone from this plane of existence. The YouTube channel Arix mentioned that time quests do actually have a different quest icon indicating to the player that you should prioritize this quest or you could automatically fail it if you take too much time. However, we don't have any footage of this as you were not allowed to show or you were not meant to show uh, menu systems, even though some people did. Regardless, I have not seen footage of what this looks like, but it's great to know that it should look different in your quest menu. So always be sure to check any new quests to see if they are timed. In the game, you can choose to play as human or beast Ren. The game director stated in an interview that the main course of the story will not be affected by your race, but certain strategies for progressing the game may differ because of attitudes towards beast Ren or humans, depending on what country you are in. We saw this play out with the YouTube channel Super Rad. There was a gate that you could only pass through if you were beast Ren, because your permit pictured a beast Ren. So if you were a human, one of the ways you could pass through the gate was to purchase a Beast Ren mask. If you were just Beast Ren, you would have been allowed straight through. The main point is, don't worry too much about your race. Regardless of what you pick, you likely will need to do some things a little different, but your main quest experience won't change. On the topic of quests, let's talk save files. You will only have one save file in Dragon's Dogma 2. This was confirmed in the interview with the Renault Gazette Journal. While you only have one save, you can change the appearance of your main character and your main pawn in the game, with the exception of their race. You can't change that once you've started. The reason why I place this topic of save files under quests is because the game really wants you to experience consequence. And the YouTube channel Remap spoke about this a bit, and you can see it on Ouroboros' channel. When you die, you can either load your last save or load at your last inrest. Essentially, if an NPC died, or you didn't get the right outcome you wanted for a quest, you will likely need to use an older save, i.e. the inrest, and have to replay a fair bit of content to get a different outcome. It is not impossible to get the right outcome you want from quests, but when you consider how long it might take to defeat a certain enemy, like YouTubers often spoke about encounters lasting 20 to 30 minutes, you may simply want to accept the consequence and move on. The director spoke about this in an interview with Automaton and specifically that NPCs can die and die permanently. So now let's talk about NPCs. On the topic of NPCs, let's talk about death, affinity, romance, and towns. In the Automaton interview, the game director confirmed that NPCs can permanently die. Now, I assume that includes NPCs that have side quests, which would mean you would no longer be able to complete those quests. A tweet added more information saying that if NPCs are killed, they are taken to the morgue and you can use a wake stone to bring them back to life, but they only stay a few days before being buried. I am not too sure if this is the way the game gives you a last chance to complete any side quests, but at this stage, I would definitely be cautious with NPCs and this definitely sits in the category of F around and find out. The YouTube channel Remap actually spoke about using wake stones on NPCs straight away, how they discovered some random NPCs battling a wolf and decided to help out. And when the NPCs died, they revived them at that moment with a wake stone. I'm going to go into more detail about wake stones a bit later. For now, let's talk affinity. In Dragon's Dogma 1, there was an affinity system, NPCs liking you or disliking you based on your actions, which would have real consequences like merchants providing better quality items. We don't know a lot about the affinity system in Dragon's Dogma 2, except that it has been powered up according to the director, and affinity with a parent also impacts your affinity with their kid. We also know that high levels of affinity with NPCs can lead to relationships. In an article by This Is Game, the director said this, As was the case in part one, there are fixed male and female NPCs with episodes related to love. If a character you like has an episode like that, you're lucky. If your affinity with these characters exceeds a certain level, your relationship can develop into something more than friends. Additionally, there are events that occur only when such developments occur. These likability related events can also be found in NPCs that cannot be dated. The YouTube channel Dantix looked into the game rating for Dragon's Dogma 2 and the documents submitted for the game confirmed that our characters will have scenes, or let's say wrestling in bed. Very, very light wrestling. So yes, there will be romance in the game. And finally on the topic of NPCs, towns. 
There are no load screens in this game with the exception of entering a cutscene and as such you can lead a monster straight into a town. The villagers of that town will assist, well some of them will if they are brave while others will not. While the town may assist you, you may also risk killing the NPCs. Now Games Radar said that they could revive NPCs with a skill under the Magic Archer. While we saw this ability being used on your own pawns, we don't actually have footage of this being used on NPCs. If that is the case, that might be an easy way to get a town's assistance and not risk losing any NPCs. Right, next topic, under density and exploration. Let's talk about map size, transportation and fast travel, unscripted chaos, collectibles and upgrades, stamina and mining. The director said during the Automaton interview that the map size was approximately four times of Dragon's Dogma 1, but the size was not necessarily as important as the density. And what they meant by this is that they never want players to get bored whilst traveling. There seems to always be something happening. This was a common thread between all the footage. Griffins and Psychopses completely distracting you from whatever quest you are trying to complete. It is for this reason that transportation and fast travel is restricted. There are no mounts to traverse the landscape unless you count accidentally holding onto a griffin as a mount and they hope that the pathways available are so enjoyable that you don't want to ride a horse. Now that being said there is a fast travel option in the game. One option is the ox cart which can be clearly seen in Ouroboros gameplay footage. The ox cart goes between two set points however it's not without danger. The ox cart can be ambushed so it's not a guaranteed way to reach another town. You can doze off when in the ox cart to essentially speed up time and reach your destination in an instant. However, that does not prevent you from being ambushed, which exactly happens in the footage. Fairy stones and port crystals have been confirmed as another form of fast travel, but have been said to be super rare during your first playthrough. This was confirmed during the Automaton interview. In Dragon's Dogma 1, you could obtain an eternal fairy stone, but I believe this was actually later a later addition to the game and it would allow unlimited teleports to port crystals. Port crystals act as the like destination and the fairy stones are the item that you use to fast travel. It does not sound like an eternal fairy stone will be available or at least it won't be on your first playthrough. Next point, unscripted chaos. This kind of relates to my previous point about map density. There are lots of things that can happen. They are not scripted. Everyone's journey is going to be slightly different, like the YouTuber Rurikhan who pitted two Cyclopses against a Griffin. Let's talk collectibles. There are collectibles known as Seeker Tokens, 240 in the game to be exact. And at set intervals, these tokens can be turned in for rewards, but we don't know what those rewards are yet. You can also collect upgrades in different ways. The channel Remap spoke about collecting scarabs that increase your stamina. When exploring, you can also discover upgrade materials such as ore from mining. Now let's talk about vocations. What vocations are, how you unlock them, general gameplay and leveling. Vocations are essentially your class. It dictates what weapons you can use and what abilities you have. In Dragon's Dogma 1, many of the vocations had access to two weapon types. For example, the Strider could use both daggers and a bow. Holding R1 would access your dagger weapon skills and holding L1 would access your bow weapon skills. Dragon's Dogma 2 has much more specialized vocations, with almost all the vocations only able to use one weapon type. The exception to that is the Warfarer vocation, which can use all weapon types. There are 10 vocations available. I'm not going to go into the specifics of each vocation because there are a million videos covering every detail of each vocation. But in general, the first four vocations, Fighter, Archer, Thief and Mage, are the basic vocations that you will start with. They are also available to your main pawn. You can then unlock the Master vocations, Warrior and Sorcerer, through a quest, according to IGN. The last four vocations, Magic Archer, Mystic Spearhand, Trickster and Warfarer, are hybrid vocations and only available to Arisen, i.e. you, the main player. I haven't seen confirmation to how these classes unlock, with people just saying it's related to a quest. However, the website does mention Vocation Maesters, who after gaining their approval will give you access to their vocation or teach you specific techniques. I imagine you need to find these experts to unlock the hybrid vocations.
The way that combat works in Dragon's Dogma 2 is that pressing L1 switches between weapon specific skills, like for the Magic Archer firing a piloted fire arrow, or an arrow that can resurrect pawns. Using weapon skills will consume your stamina. Pressing R1 activates a more vocation specific skill. For the fighter, this was using your shield to block. For the Mystic Spearhand, this was a teleport move. As you level up your vocation, you can purchase more skills and assign them to your preferred button. You don't have to be too nervous about locking in a vocation because you can switch between vocations relatively easily. In Dragon's Dogma 1, you did this at an inn. In DD2, there are definitely vendors that let you switch. If they're exclusive to an inn, I'm not too sure yet. You can also change your weapon skills at campfires, so you don't have to go back to town if something is not working for you. Augments return in Dragon's Dogma 2, however, I have not seen too many people speaking about it or confirming details. In Dragon's Dogma 1, Augments act like passive buffs, such as halving stamina consumed when lifting objects, and they had to be unlocked on a specific vocation, but once unlocked, they could be used on any vocation, and that would encourage you to use different vocations. As far as I'm aware, we don't know how this will function in DD2, but we just know that they exist. On the topic of leveling, there is another system that has changed stat growth. When you leveled a vocation in DD1, the stat growth was impacted by the vocation. For example, out of all the vocations, fighters gained the most health stat growth between levels 2 and 10. Warriors gained the most health stat growth between level 11 and 100. This meant if you wanted to min-max your stats, you had to use a specific vocation, often the vocation you did not want to use, to get the right stats first, and then move on to the vocation you did want to use. This has now changed, confirmed by both Arix and Rurikan, with your stat points automatically transferring to the right category based on the vocation. What this means is that if you level a fighter and then want to change to a mage, all that stat growth that you built on the fighter, which likely will be health, will automatically transfer over to likely magic attack or whatever stat DD2 is prioritizing for mages. From everything I have heard and read, this is my current understanding of stat growth. Right now, I want to talk about combat in more general terms, from the general feeling, lock-on, climbing enemies, toppling mechanics, resistances and weaknesses, multicasting, environmental interactions, and debuffs. Starting with the general feeling, from what has been described, it looks very similar to Dragon's Dogma 1, with many people's first comment being, Where's the dodge button? While most of the vocations I saw had a dash button, in the first game, only the Strider had a typical dodge roll skill, which now I believe is on the Thief. Because of how the game looks, and you have these huge monsters with telegraphed moves, it definitely is instinctual to want more movement and dodge abilities, but you quickly learn that it is more about your team composition, positioning, having the right weapons, and having enough items to get you through an encounter. There is very little footage of this because I don't think you are meant to record your menus, but in the first game, when you want to use an item, opening the menu pauses the game. You can give health to yourself or allies, you can restore your stamina, and even apply buffs. You could be mid-riding a monster about to run out of stamina, which means you'll be thrown off, and just pause, restore stamina, and keep on going. Having enough items to keep your party alive is a big part of the first game, and I assume it will play similarly in Dragon's Dogma 2. In DD1 on PC, you could hotkey items. However, I always felt it was more beneficial to just pause and open your menu. In DD2, there is a hotkey option for controller. Now, when you hold L1, you can use the D-pad to quick use items. However, it still looks like you can open your menu, pause in the game, and apply items. I definitely feel like it'll be similar to first experiencing Monster Hunter, where at first it feels almost clunky, but that's not really the right word. But once you get the hang of it and familiar with how to use your weapons, it really smooths out and becomes much more enjoyable. Similar to the first game, there is no lock-on. You have to make sure you are facing in the right direction and aiming your melee swings at the target. Archers have different aiming modes as part of their vocation. By now, I am sure you have seen other footage of players climbing monsters. You can jump and hold onto a monster, or in some cases, certain weapon skills will end in a grab. For example, the Mystic Spearhand allows you to teleport, and then you can grab the monster. While on the monster, you can perform certain weapon skills, such as the Mystic Spearhand can twirl the spear. Apart from climbing monsters, there's also a toppling mechanic. 
The pop-up talks about pushing or pulling a monster to knock them off balance, but the footage I've mainly seen shows when an enemy is already off balance, players attack the leg to cause a monster to come crashing down. It's hard to tell exactly how to trigger this because your pawns are often helping, but the basic premise is that you can cause monsters to stumble and then you can attack their legs to cause them to fall. Now let's talk about elemental resistances and weaknesses. Similar to the first game, enemies can be resistant or weak to certain elements. Many people commented on how fire seemed to destroy the griffin, and in DD1, fire was an elemental weakness of the griffin. Others commented on how the golems were resistant to magic, and they felt like they did no damage using the magic archer. Similar to DD1, golems were immune to magic, and you needed to attack their glowing disc with physical damage. What this all boils down to is having a balanced team. Now let's talk about multicasting or spell syncing. We have seen footage of sorcerers performing the same spell in unison. In DD1, you could sync the same spell with someone else to cast it more quickly, allowing you to unleash more powerful spells that would normally take a longer time to prepare. I believe it could also have reduced the stamina, but I'm not sure. I don't think we know the exact benefits of multicasting yet for DD2, but it looks like it quickens the cast time. Right, environmental interactions. There are lots of different ways that you can use the environment to your advantage. Enemies can fall off ledges, or more accurately, can be pushed off ledges. If they land in water, they will instantly die. However, you won't be able to get any loot that they drop. We've also seen other environmental traps, like opening a dam to knock over a cyclops, cutting a rope bridge, and unleashing a boulder down a hill. On top of all that, the trickster seems like a great vocation for getting enemies to jump straight off edges. Whenever you battle with a monster, definitely a good idea to look around to see if anything can help you out. There are also other environmental interactions, specifically around elements. I saw a pop-up talk about how lightning can spread further if there's water. I imagine there are other environment element interactions that can give you an advantage. Let's talk about debuffs or more accurately debilitations. Debilitations are negative status effects that can be applied to you, allies or enemies. I don't think we know if DD2 will have all the same debilitations as DD1. At this stage we just know it is in the game. In DD1 there are of course the most obvious debilitations that you would expect like burning or poison. But there are also other debilitations that work in tandem. For example, tarring causes double damage from burning, or drenched, i.e. the characters covered in water, causes double damage from ice or thunder-based attacks, but resistance to fire. One of the coolest things that was told to me when playing DD1 is about torpor, which reduces movement and attack speed. You can apply this to enemies by upgrading rusted weapons. And you actually start off with rusted weapons, which seem really bad, but apparently upgrading them allows you to apply torpor, which is a powerful debilitation. I will definitely be on the lookout for something similar in Dragon's Dogma 2. Right, that's all I have on combat. Let's talk campfires and nighttime, specifically the dangers of nighttime, lanterns and light sources, campfire kits, campfire cooking, conversations around the campfire, and potential risks. Nighttime in Dragon's Dogma is incredibly dangerous. There are more enemies at night and different enemies at night. And even with a light source, you can't see that well. The Magic's Archer's skill is incredibly useful though. More often than not, you will accidentally stumble into an enemy or a group of enemies. The game director spoke about this a lot and specifically the tension that should come with nighttime. This is also why fast travel is restricted. Part of the tension in the game comes from going on these adventures and then the sun going down and everything becoming that little bit more dangerous. So to be prepared for nighttime, you need a couple of things. The first is a lantern and lantern oil. You do need to fill up lanterns with oil, they will eventually run out. If you run out of lanterns, you'll need another light source, like the Magic Archer. You can give lanterns to your pawns as well, so they will also need to be topped up with oil. The other thing that you should also take is a campfire kit. When you're out exploring, you can find campfires, and if you have a campfire kit, you can set up a tent and rest at campfires. Resting at a campfire has similar benefits to resting at an inn, as it will recover your health and stamina. Dragon's Dogma 2 introduced a loss gauge system where you will lose health and only be able to recover it by resting. In DD1, you could actually just use items to heal to 100%. So this is quite a big change. What it will mean is that your team will get battered after each battle and slowly start to have less health, making campfires really important. 
However, you need to remember that time still passes when you rest, and this is how people failed the time quest to save the boy from the wolves. They slept at a campfire and by morning the boy was lost. So if you have timed quests, you might want to push through the night to complete them in case you have already taken too long. You can do some other really important things at campfires as well. You can cook at campfires, which will give you different buffs depending on what you eat. And the devs are particularly proud of the in real life meat animation. You can also change your weapon skills at campfires. So if you have just equipped a new weapon skill and you're not quite vibing with it, rather than return to town, you can swap it at the campfire. We have also seen that you can have conversations with your pawns around the campfire. In DD1, you can also influence your pawn's secondary inclination through conversations, and I'll speak about inclinations in the pawn category. However, I do wonder if conversations around the campfire will also impact how the pawns behave. With all that being said, there are some potential risks that come with campfires, which seem similar to the ox cart. As time continues to pass, it is possible to be ambushed. We don't have footage of this, just that it has been mentioned in the pop-up tutorial, saying that you should eliminate any surrounding enemies to decrease the likelihood of an ambush. Overall, campfires will be a big part of the game, especially if you are on a long quest, as your party will start losing health that cannot be recovered until you rest. Let's talk about wake stones and reviving yourself, pawns, and allies. When you die in Dragon's Dogma 2, you are given the option to use a wake stone if you have them. Selecting yes will revive you from the dead and you can keep playing. Selecting no will then give you the option to load the last save or load the last in rest. So you might be thinking, well, just use a wake stone, right? So you don't have to replay a section. The thing is with wake stones, you can use them to revive other NPCs. In DD1, there was actually a quest to revive the son of a character. In Dragon's Dogma 2, we know that NPCs can permanently die. So you may not want to use the wake stones on yourself for the sake of having to replay a section. It really depends on how common wake stones will be. My guess will be, not very common, and it also depends on how much you are struggling. If you had back-to-back -back fights like a griffin into a cyclops into something else, and you're really close to surviving and beating this encounter, sure, maybe then. But personally, I'm going to be very, very selective with my use of wake stones until I see how easy they are to obtain. Now, when pawns go down, you don't use a wake stone to get them up. You just have to interact with them to get them back on their feet, and they will return with the same level of health that you currently have. However, if a pawn is not recovered quick enough, they will be removed from your party, or if a pawn falls into water, they will go straight back to their realm. So using the environment also has risks for you. Right, on the topic of pawns, let's talk more about pawns. Specifically, main pawns, body type impacts, hiring pawns, pawn specializations, pawn knowledge, dragon's plague, and pawn inclinations. When you start the game, you can create and customize your main pawn. This pawn will follow you throughout the game, assisting in combat, quests, and carrying gear for you. They level with you, and you can change their vocation and gear as needed. When creating your main character and your pawn, you need to be aware that body type will impact certain characteristics. This has been confirmed that taller characters can actually carry more weight and will have a longer reach, which is perfect for melee classes. Smaller characters will have better stamina. I really don't know how much this will impact gameplay, but my gut reaction would be to make a fighter vocation, like with a sword and shield, tall, and other vocations probably short. For example, thief already has more stamina, so maybe thieves should be short. And I assume mages should be short too, so they can cast more spells from more stamina. Not too sure. In addition to your main pawn, you can hire two other pawns from a rift stone, or I assume just wandering around the world, similar to the first game. If Dragon's Dogma 2 is the same as the first game, your non-main pawns will not level with you, meaning you'll need to swap them out as you level up. The pawn hiring system seems to be the same as the first game. Hiring pawns cost rift crystals, RC. However, the cost of hiring a pawn depends on the difference between your level and the pawn's level i.e. if you are level 5 and you try to hire a level 20 pawn, it will cost a lot. If you are the same level as the pawn, it costs nothing. You should also be able to hire pawns of friends, people who are literally on your friends list, for free, which is a really cool way to share your characters with friends. Apparently the first game implemented an XP scaling system depending on the difference between your level and your pawns level, meaning if your pawns are much higher level than you, you actually get less XP, making it a bit harder to just go around and steamroll everything. 
not sure if this will be in Dragon's Dogma 2. Pawn specializations have been introduced in Dragon's Dogma 2, and these are really useful passive abilities. For example, one specialization allows pawns to understand Elvish. The elves in the game don't speak the common tongue, so you'll need to have a pawn with you to understand the elves. Another specialization has the pawn sort through loot amongst the party members to avoid being encumbered, which sounds very nice, not having to move items between all your party members and having a pawn automatically do it for you. Another one marks upgrade materials on the map, which is huge for those exploring trying to upgrade their gear. Another one will actually buy items off you directly, so rather than having to go back to a vendor in town, you can sell it straight to your pawn. Another one will haggle item prices for you so you can get a better price from vendors. Pawn specializations are huge and you should definitely be looking out for specializations and reading the descriptions. You don't have to just hire the pawns with the right specializations though. You can actually change pawn specializations with items. Let's talk about pawn knowledge. Pawns will gain knowledge about certain things as you use them. For example, if you keep fighting Cyclopses, they should learn the weak spots, the elemental resistances or advantages, or moves that may work better. And the cool thing is, you can hire pawns with this knowledge to help you out. If you're having a hard time with griffins, you will want to find a pawn with experience fighting griffins. And it's not just combat that they gain knowledge in, but also quest knowledge. If you hire a pawn that has already completed a quest that you are currently completing, they may give you a hint, or they may be more familiar with the area. You don't want to just hire other pawns with knowledge, but you want people to hire your pawn so your pawn gains knowledge from other people's games. In Dragon's Dogma 1, your pawn's knowledge would sink when you rested at an inn, so this might be the same in DD2. Knowledge is not the only thing pawns will obtain from other people's worlds. They can also contract a contagious disease known as Dragon's Plague. We actually don't know what this does yet apart from what is written on the website. Have a listen. Dragon's Plague is a contagious disease-like condition that infects pawns as they travel between worlds. Rather than being weakened, pawns with the disease are said to display remarkable performance and to become conspicuously bold in their speech and behavior. According to folklore, when the symptoms of Dragon's Plague reach a terminal stage, it will result in devastating calamity, but the veracity of those claims is unclear. The other aspect of pawns that you should know about are inclinations. Pawn inclinations were in Dragon's Dogma 1, but they are different now and we don't know exactly how they will function. In general, I think that they will impact the priority order of actions. For example, do they prioritize taking down the monster or do they prioritize getting an ally up? There are four inclinations, kind-hearted, calm, simple, and straightforward. The descriptions give a brief clue to how it may impact the pawn's behavior, but I don't think we quite know yet. For example, Kind-Hearted says quick to aid allies in need. Calm says favors defense and invasion, employing clever tactics. Pawns with Calm will use more environmental tactics? I don't know. Right, that's all I know about pawns. Let's move on to upgrades. You can upgrade your gear at a blacksmith, costing money and resources you have looted from enemies and the environment. An interesting change in DD2 is that the blacksmiths have different styles, and depending on which blacksmith you visit, it will level a different stat. So before you start leveling up your gear, you might want to see what blacksmith options you have available. Okay, the last topic for this video, frames per second, a big one. Dragon's Dogma 2 has been confirmed as having uncapped FPS. However, consoles will be aiming for around 30 frames per second. If you're on PC, it will depend on your hardware. Right, that is quite literally everything I know about Dragon's Dogma 2 without having played the game yet. Be sure to subscribe if you want to see more DD2 content as I'll be uploading even more. Follow me on Twitch to tune in live. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to support the channel, you can also leave a comment. You can leave the words Dragon's Dogma 2. As usual, it's been a pleasure. This is Marlin Games. Peace.